and this will be my first introduction to everyone now. My name is Kevin Blyer, and I'm a professional smartass. <laughs> right, if you couldn't tell already. And in my capacity as a professional smartass, this afternoon, I'm going to teach you how to write a joke. And maybe why to write a joke. And, oh, wait, before I forget, though, of course. Right? <laughs> That's what they always say. When you're a little bit nervous, as I am, when there are some technical malfunctions, as there have been, <laughs> when there's a large audience, as you are, and you want to win them over, you want, to, want them to like you, as I do, they say, start with the joke, <laughs> exclamation point. Problem is, I don't know any jokes, <laughs> period. True story. Now, I may have spent the last two decades, most of my adult life, uh, writing political comedy, but along those lines, along that way, I never learned a joke. True. Actually, not entirely true. I do know two jokes, and just to be safe, I brought one of them with me this afternoon. <laughs> yes, blue cards, the last refuge of scoundrels and comedy writers. It smells funny. It's in there somewhere. Nope, not that one. <laughs> That's for the Aspen Institute. Um, inside joke right there. Uh, okay, so I brought one joke, and I'll start with that. Knock, knock. <laughs> You're good, you know this stuff. Well done. Let's start from the top. Knock, knock. <laughs> the interrupting cow. <laughs> Moo! <laughs> yeah. That's, that joke goes over huge with six-year-olds. That is, six-year-olds who love TED conferences. Yeah, so the funny thing is, I don't really know any jokes. I'm not a comedian. I don't have a million of them. I have two of them. One of them is dirty, and the other is about a cow that interrupts people. So, however, I do know how sometimes, when the mood strikes, to write jokes, and that's why I'm here today. How to write a joke, even if you don't have the prompter. Well, you're about to get all the trade secrets, believe me. First, I'm going to ask a question. What is a joke? Right? What is a joke? A great man once said, and by that I mean Steve Martin. There we go. No. There we go. It'll all get fixed in post. All right. How to write a joke. A great man once said, and by that I mean Steve Martin, a great man once said, comedy is the ability to make people laugh without making them puke. Now, <laughs> it makes sense. It's funny because it's true. Because, and actually I should ask, are there any gelatologists in the audience? Gelatologists. If you're, raise your hand if you're a gelatologist. Too shy? Okay. Because gelatologists are experts in laughter. That's a thing. Yeah, I didn't know either. And according to gelatology, the science of gelatology, laughter is a very simple process. Laughter is, and I'm quoting, a collision of psychological and physiological responses wherein the left side of the frontal lobe interprets the word presented to us, deciphers the order of the words and their meaning, while the right side determines whether those words and that order and that meaning is funny enough to trigger the limbic system in the center brain, the amygdala and the hippocampus, which is up there somewhere, to stimulate the motor region of the brain and induce a temporary spasm of the intercostal muscles between the ribs and the diaphragm, forcing more air out through the larynx than we can control with the vocal cords, activating 15 different facial muscles, the tear ducts, and a massive acute release of endorphins and other endogenous opioid neurotransmitters, triggering nothing less than an uncontrollable, if transient, morphine-like euphoria. <laughs> so yeah, piece of cake. You want to write a joke? Just write a bunch of words in a particular order that does that. <laughs> so telling a joke is simply activating someone's intercostal muscles just beyond their ability to control them. In other words, comedy is the ability to make people laugh without making them puke. <laughs> so how do you do that? How do you write a joke? Well, that's actually pretty simple as well. There it is. Establish premise, establish pattern, establish expectation, violate expectation. Establish premise, establish pattern, establish expectation, violate expectation. 
Say it with me. Establish premise, establish pattern, establish expectation, violate expectation. One more time, just for kicks. Establish premise, establish pattern, establish violate, move. <laughs> it's that simple. So when I say knock, knock, I'm establishing the premise. There's someone at the door. When I say who's there, I'm establishing a pattern. See, call and response. When I say the interrupting cow, I'm establishing an expectation. You know the joke, you're expecting that cow's last name. And when I say the interrupting moo, I violated your expectations. You did not expect that cow to interrupt you. You of all people, how dare that cow? <laughs> of course, I have to admit that there are other jokes. I only know that one joke. There are other jokes with other rules, other structures, other patterns. Uh, they're not all dirty, they're not all about a cow. <clears throat> and in fact, you've got, you taking notes? Establish premise to the absurd extreme. Adopt the opposite. Rule of threes, rule of threes, or rule of threes. Specificity is your friend. Funniest word goes at the end. Is that obvious? K, K. According to Mel Brooks, another great man, K is hands down the funniest letter. <laughs> you want to say salmon? Don't say salmon. Say turkey or donkey or write a joke about Kirk Kerkorian. <laughs> brevity is the soul of wit. Now, whoever came up with that rule, I'm just saying they might have just said brevity is wit, seems to me. <laughs> right? Fart jokes. Who doesn't love a good fart joke? <laughs> and finally, President Trump, am I right? Who's with me? <laughs> that was easy, and yet you laughed. So everybody got that? We are just scratching the surface on how to write a joke. But if you do some of those rules in some of that order, at some point, at some time in the near future or the not so near future, you might accidentally have stumbled upon a joke. Now, <clears throat> I wrote a joke a few minutes ago. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Okay, good, phew. If you didn't, I didn't know where I was going to go with this. Now, it's a bit of a cheesy joke, and as you hear the joke, keep in mind, that I have won Emmys for my political comedy. <laughs> Emmys, plural. <laughs> All right. Who's got two thumbs and no sense of direction? This guy. <laughs> I've also won a Peabody. Okay. <laughs> Just testing the room. We'll get to the political comedy a bit later. But it's easy, right? Here's where it gets complicated. How do you write a joke in 2017? In other words, how? When the world doesn't seem so funny, how do you write a joke? First step, you elect one president. Boom. <laughs> Where's my drummer? I was going to get a rim shot from that one. Now, before I go any further, I feel like I should offer an apology. Uh, the rumors are true. Donald Trump is president of the United States of America and there's a good chance it's my fault. Let me explain. Um, I'm told he ran for president in part because he couldn't take a joke. Uh, a few jokes, actually. Uh, jokes that I helped write uh, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner a few years ago. You might remember... Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh! Yeah, that thin skin got a little thinner that night. Um, you might remember that was the night that President Obama uh, pointed out that up until that moment, the most difficult decision Donald Trump had ever made was whether or not to fake fire Gary Busey or Meatloaf. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, those jokes got under his skin. Uh, it motivated him, maybe, and he ran for president. <clears throat> and he won the presidency. <laughs> and you're welcome, and I'm sorry, and in my mind, some of you are booing, my, booing me right now, and there's a very good chance that Donald Trump is tweeting about me right now. <laughs> Although I think we can all agree, it's not likely that Donald Trump gets his news from TED Talks. <laughs> of course, when the world gets a little less funny, that's when a particular kind of humor comes in. Ha, ta-da, political satire. Um, the less funny the world gets, the more people turn to political satire. It's happened historically. Political satire becomes, in a sense, the coin of the realm. And when I went to college, this college, you certainly couldn't major in writing political satire specifically, but 
the growth industry that it is, it is the fact that at some schools you can actually major in, you can get a BA in, I guess let's call it that BS. Uh, there are doctoral the students writing theses on The Daily Show Effect. I think I'm quoted in a couple of them. I was a writer at The Daily Show for much of the last decade. I was writing fake news before fake news became fake news. <laughs> <coughs> and when I was at the Fake News Daily Show, I would often hear, maybe from some of you, uh, that they got their real no news from The Daily Show. Um, and on behalf of The Daily Show, let me just say that it, that is utterly flattering, but entirely horrifying. <laughs> getting your news from The Daily Show is like getting your medical prescriptions filled by Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Odds are, we have what you're looking for, but you might want to get a second opinion. <laughs> Still, it's like I said, it's a growth industry. And when, the, when something truly absurd happens, like when a reality show host becomes the leader of the free world, people would come to me and say, Kevin, oh my gosh, mana from heaven, right? Your job just got so much easier. The jokes write themselves. I assure you they do not. <laughs> uh, you know, when a guy goes into the OR, you don't tell the surgeon, uh, heals itself, don't it? <laughs> Truth is, as the news gets less funnier, sometimes the harder the procedure. Um, and yet, it is the case that at a time like these, people turn to political satire. And I sometimes wonder if they should, what they want. Will it help them get to sleep at night? Yes. Will it help them wake up in the morning? I don't know. Um, because I do wonder in 2017 whether satire is up to the task. Um, and now here comes the serious part of the comedy talk. Uh, I'm going to regret this because, like I said, I'm a professional smartass, so earnestness is not really a good look on me. <laughs> but there is a saying in comedy writing, don't joke the joke. Sometimes you can't joke the joke. And I do wonder how effective we can be and what we actually get done uh, just by making fun of something that was so absurd we couldn't have made it up. Um, and that's kind of where we are right now, where the headlines are hilarious, yes they are, but the punchline, the premise is now the punchline. Um, because I think we all agree, others have said it today, um, our president is something of a comic book character, like him or not. Um, he's a comic book character that was fused when a crybaby merged with a bully somehow, and uh, his superpower is having a thin skin and a hundred word vocabulary. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going for it, people. <laughs> if a great man ever says, a great man once said, he won't be talking about President Trump. <clears throat> Donald J. Trump makes George W. Bush look like William F. Buckley. <laughs> there is no precedent for this president. Uh, but here's the thing, the joke's not on him, the joke's on us. We have, as satirists, been out satired, bigly. <laughs> it is true, uh, our most basic understanding of civic rights and civic duties and civics have been upended. Up is down, fake news is truth, truth is fake news. Left is right, right is writer, and writer is wrong. It's as if George Orwell wrote a sequel, 2017. It's double speak year. And you have to ask what's funny about that. How do you joke the joke? It's not a rhetorical question. You can, plenty of people are, and it's downright funny. But at a time when, yes, comedy is the ability to make people laugh without making them puke, what if reality is making people puke without making them laugh? Uh, <laughs> and what then? It's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> Feel that awkward silence? Keep hoping a cow will interrupt us. Um, <laughs> but we know the answer. It's a difficult question, but we know the answer. And here we go. Here's the rousing speech. There's only one choice, only one path forward. You keep resisting. You keep insisting that there's something funny about the whole fiasco. You ask, OK, well, that happened, but what's funny now? And you keep going, and you, and you start with a joke, like this. Who has two tiny thumbs and no sense of direction? That guy. <laughs> Not bad. Yes, we cynical satirists, we few, we unhappy few, we band of smart asses. We are the type that think the nihilistic belief that life is a joke, but we also think it's no laughing matter. And when times like these happen, the only way to go forward is to turn no laughing matter into a laughing matter. But to do so intelligently, right? to not use our knee-jerk responses, but to use our brain, to use brain-jerk responses 
to use our amygdala and our, our hippocampuses and to say something truly incisive, like a clever fart joke, or the size of his hypocrisy, not his thumbs, or the failure of his policies, or the content of his character, or I could go on, and go on we must. We must, and now you can, because I've taught you how to write a joke. So here's where we are. It's your turn to write a joke, and you're gonna do it right now, right here. Pressure's on. You're gonna write a joke. It's gonna be a simple one. It's gonna be a knock-knock joke. And I'll give you a hint. Donald Trump is at the door. <laughs> but since it's your joke, you're gonna start. There we go. Who's there? Donald Trump who? Aha! <laughs> Not so easy, is it? They don't write themselves, but they need to be written. Thank you very much.